into the Mark Lee Siegel Theater Center here at the Karate Center in CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of the Siegel Theater Center. And next to me is Valeria Rani from Humanism. And uh, we put this thing together. It's the second time uh, that we are trying to uh, implement, think about, and create an exchange of Italian uh, playwrights coming here to New York. Again, we have an advisory board, people have mentioned in here, who really helped us uh, to select uh, of what we think relevant and urgent plays that come from Italy, voices from Europe, and I think we all know how important it is that we hear voices from all around the world, and also from Italy, where perhaps over the last decades the, the, the voices weren't heard as strongly, or there wasn't an initiative, or there wasn't a Valeria there who could also um, help it. And, uh, a New York Advisory Board chose a place that was suggested by the Italian Advisory Board. I think Marvin Costa is here, who was on the Advisory Board. Uh, Kate from the play company wasn't here, but Melissa is here uh, tonight, um, and also others. So a lot of work went um, into, into the Italian Playwrights Project. We at the Siegel Center on Bridge Academia and Professional Theater, International and American Theater, and I think this really is uh, one of the uh, the great evenings when we put together um, an evening with playwrights. We also published uh, the plays um, from the very first um, a, a playwright exchange, and we have the books out. You can buy them uh, after this. Normally they are $30 tonight, they are just uh, $15. And also, we would like to thank the Italian Cultural Institute, which is with us tonight, for supporting this, I think, really important uh, uh, publication. It is actually uh, uh, these uh, winners from big prizes in Italy, and it's the only book where you can find plays in translation in English of significant, the Tony Kushners of Italy, by the way, they're the only way someone can read them in English translation is in the Siegel Center um, uh, publication in a way we are very proud of it, but we also stunned that this is uh, the case. So thank you to Giorgio Fanstrat and Javier for, for uh, helping uh, to, to put this uh, all here uh, together. Um, with us we have tonight one of the playwrights in person. We also want to have at least one playwright here. Um, so Elisa Kasseri is here. Where's Elisa? So, yeah. so um, Kasseri, Kasseri, which is a very significant uh, uh, Italian writer and uh, essayist and novelist. And this is her uh, first play, Mario. Uh, here's a seat for you. you want okay. This is Mario Frati, a great uh, uh, American, Italian or Italian American uh, uh, writer. So uh, we welcome. So the playwrights on the project are um, Elisa, as we just said, Giuliana Musso, Armando. Pirozzi and uh, Fabrizio Sinisi, and uh, so um, Elisa is the one who could be um, with us. So we will have readings of short excerpts from those plays, four of them, 15 minutes, they will be in a row. Then we have a, a panel discussion here, maybe um, I think uh, uh, Juliana will join us shortly on Skype, and then we also have a Q&A with all of you here. The, Plays are directed by uh, professional uh, directors, uh, read by professional actors here in New York. Mark Sara and uh, John directed uh, the plays. All the bios are in here. Irene is here for John, who couldn't uh, make it, but we were very grateful that he took the time um, to do this. So um, I hope you will all um, enjoy it. And there will be a little reception afterwards here in the room, and I hope you all can stay. If you couldn't ask all your crystal to share a glass of wine with the artist, and afterwards, if you still want to do this, a little with gathering at an archive bar around the corner on the 36th Street, and it's also in the book here, it's called The Archive, between 5th and Madison and the south side in the middle. Um, before I give the microphone to Valeria, also take out the, uh, your iPhone or your phone for one second, and try to put it on silent over here. It should say, ring or silent. <laughs> it never rings in our readings, and truly it's true, this is out because we take time, so please do double check. Uh, again, thank you all for coming, it's a very, very busy time in New York, especially in December, and uh, it was a bit always a risk to do that, but we really appreciate it. We need good theater, but we need good audience, so really thank you all for your interest and time to come here tonight and listen to, to voices and realities uh, from, from um, another continent. Uh, Valeria. Uh, I have nothing to add because uh, Frank uh, told everything, and uh, thank you very much to everybody to follow our project. It's a very challenging project, and uh, we will have a time to talk later. Enjoy the readings now. Thank you. So now 
I am going to introduce uh, one of the directors, Sarah, who actually directed two pieces. We will hear a short synopsis um, of each play, so we have a, bit, a little bit of contact. Again, thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. Thank you guys very much for all being here tonight. I uh, had the pleasure of working very shortly on a, a notebook for winter by Armando Pirozzi. And I'm just going to read a little of the synopsis so you have a little context for the scenes you're about to see. Um, it is a two-actor play which, in three acts, tells the story of an introvert professor of literature who finds a burglar on his way back home. The knife-wielding burglar wants something unexpected from him. It is a question of life or death. During the entire night, the two characters talk, exchange ideas, feelings, ask painful questions out of hope and desperation in a completely new and unexpected atmosphere. And without further ado, uh, Fetty Kirko and Michael John and Proda. My God, don't be afraid. I have nothing. I know. OK, I'll give you what's in my pocket, but there's nothing in the house. Relax easy with the knife. I have no intention of hurting you. Then lower the knife, please. Put the bag on the floor, easy. They, they're oranges. I don't think they'll interest you. <laughs> do you have any interest in orange? Do you want them? <laughs> what do you want? Don't try. Don't freak out. I have no intention of freaking out! My God! Oh, all the oranges on the floor. I have every intention of keeping calm. Please lower the knife. Oranges. Oh my God, listen. I'll give you what's in my pocket. Just give me time to pull out my wallet. I don't have much, though, so don't go crazy on me. I don't want money. There's nothing in the house. No money, no nothing. I don't even own a computer. They stole it from me last week on campus. What a time to be alive. Damn it! Damn it. Take it easy. I had it coming. I had it coming to find someone that would kill me in my own house. I had it coming. You're Professor Bologna, right? Yes. You teach literature at the Central University? Literature, yes. That's, that's me. Uh, who do I have the pleasure of speaking to? <laughs> oh, Nino. Well, Nino, uh, please lower the knife. Oh, uh, yes, uh, of course. Thanks. Thank you, Nino. My nerves, uh, okay, then it's all set. You're not going to kill me today. Okay. I had no intention of killing you. Okay, please tell me we're okay. I told you already. Say that you're okay. Say, I'm okay. If you insist. Yes, Nino, I insist. Okay? Okay. Okay. <sighs> Great. 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 So, Nino, you said you don't want money. We agreed. You're not going to kill me. I told you I don't even have a computer. I don't see what else there is to say, right? I think our meeting, strange as it is, could terminate here, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> I'll help you pick up the orange. No, you don't have to bother. I, I, can, I can do it on my own. I'd be, I'd be really happy to pick up my own oranges without your presence. I feel so incredibly at ease without your presence, Nino. I'm not going to do anything. I'll forget your face. I'll forget anything that's happened tonight. It'll all be nothing more than a bad dream. One of these typical damn bad dreams that I have to dream every second of my life. Please, Nino, leave me alone so I can silently pick up my oranges. Professor, I didn't come here for nothing. I'm not here to take something. I'm here to bring something back to you. What? To bring you back something and to ask a favor. A big favor. What are you talking about? What, you, what did you bring me? What favor? I brought you this. Oh, it's a little notebook. Is it mine? Yes. It was in the computer's bag. Oh, yes! So you have my computer. Is, th is that why you're here? To sell me back my computer? <laughs> I need it. My computer. Damn it! How much do you want? You have to give it back, really. It's important to me. How much? I am sorry, but there's nothing I can do about the computer. What do you mean? It's gone. It's not in my hands anymore. These things move very quickly. Who knows where it ended up, even just half an hour after I took it? These things fly. What do you want from me, Nino? I wanted to give you back your little notebook. Great. It's done. Thank you. And now? There are incredible poems in your notebook. Did you write them? What? Did you write them? The poems? Oh, these? Yeah, yeah, I wrote them. They're really pretty. <laughs> I don't know, thank you. But you came to say this to me? Uh, yes, I, I wrote them in my own hand. Do you have others? Are you still talking about my poems? Yes, of course, what are we talking about? <laughs> poems, of course! Do you have others? Nino, I'm flattered. My writing intrigues you. I'm honored. <laughs> so, uh, don't think that I laugh because I'm not honored. But you, you, you see, I find this a little ridiculous. No, not, not, not like you're ridiculous or, or that your feelings are. Don't get me wrong, but it's just, you know, attention. 
scare just a minute ago. I'm just not ready to hear certain things to talk about these stupid poems. I don't think they're stupid. They're really beautiful. Yes, of course, of course. Do you have others? Um, no, Nino. I had every intention of writing a beautiful book of poems. Maybe one day, but uh, I don't have any other poems in the house. Actually, I only, I only wrote what you read. I'm not gonna lie, this passionate request of yours please, puts me in the mood to write again. You don't have them then? Poems? No, I've only written these. You only wrote seven poems. Poems, sorry, I'm not very prolific. <laughs> uh, moreover, these are poems I wrote two years ago. I'm not sure why I didn't throw them away. You don't throw away poems. You know, I'm not a poet. Sorry to disappoint you. I am a professor of literature, so I know a thing or two, of course. Two years ago, I spent a tremendous summer with a person, and you know, like a teenager, I started writing poems. I had never done it before, and don't think I'll ever do it again. Why? Because it's useless. It's useful just to remind you that there are people that pass through your life, do whatever they want with it, and then they go. No, I'm not going to write a single word anymore. <laughs> not me. No. It's more than enough to suffer from reading and studying all these stupid words that everyone else wrote. Words for who knows who, and who knows how they were treated by these people who seem so irreplaceable. That's why, you know, that's it. And for me? Would you write a poem for me? No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, you can't write a poem like that. One shouldn't write poems at all. And certainly not like this from the top of one's head. Professor, I'm asking you to write me a poem, please. You know, come on. Let's behave like grown-ups. What kind of an absurdity is this? Don't make me raise my knife What's again. What's the matter with you? <laughs> I need a poem from you. I need it now. What's the matter with you all of a sudden? We were talking so nicely, Lord. First, you write me a poem. Nino, I don't know how to write poems. But you wrote the ones in the notebook, yeah, right? I wrote those. Yes, it was a special moment in my life. Those are so beautiful. Nino, there are magnificent poets. I can recommend you some incredible books. It's no use. I need your poems. Oh my god, why? Oh my god, you're shaking. What's, what's wrong for a poem? My wife, Anita, is in a coma at the hospital. It's been three days. She's in a coma. I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. It's a terrible thing. I had your notebook in my pocket the other night. I took it from the computer bag. I read the poem, and they seemed nice. I read one to Anita, and she did something. What? A reaction. I'm sure of this. I read your poems, and she reacted. I am sure of this. That's really beautiful. Maybe it's your voice. Did you try to read her other thing? Yes, of course. But it didn't have the same effect? You have to write other poems. At least another one. Now. Tonight. To survive the night. You know, I don't know what to say. I'm not a poet. But you wrote those poems. Yes, I wrote them. I'm sure that if I read one of your poems to Anita tonight, she'll react. She'll feel better. Maybe she won't wake up, not right away, but maybe with time. If you help me, I read her your poems and she'll wake up sooner or later. You know, I wish she was just like that. It is, certainly. Don't you want to help me? But how can I? My God, Professor, write a poem. Four or five lines, just a few lines like the others. I don't think that I can. <laughs> Try. Write them on the note. Write something. I can't think of anything. I have no ideas. One doesn't write something like this from the top of one's head. Please. You know, I know you don't care, and it doesn't make sense to say it, but my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend, uh, married another man yesterday. You see, I had decided for a while that I wouldn't write again, that I wouldn't let this fire, that I would just let this fire cool off. But there's nothing more terrifying than love. It takes over. I have no strength to write anything anymore. I, I don't care anymore. I understand. Yes. I only ask you to try a little bit. Why? For Anita. You know, this doesn't make sense. Do you realize that? Yes. Well, you're right, that poem. Right, please. I'll see what I can do. Thanks. Uh, be quick. Hey, no. <laughs> uh, of course. Sorry. Uh, right, though. If I could send my son to college, I'd like him to be in your class. He needs to learn how to write beautiful things. My son? I think of him as hopeless. Of course, I steal. What kind of example am I setting? But school? He needs to go to school. And then to college. I'll send him to you. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking. Uh, y yes, of course. <laughs> uh, write something about love. Do what I can. The old ones? They're so full of love? <laughs> you must have been crazy in love. Yeah, it seems like it. <laughs>
Nita is a good woman, a wife. Uh, certain women are perfect to be wives. Anita's perfect, for me at least. Listen, I don't know how it's turning out. I'm not sure if this will work. Well, how long is it? Three lines. Three? <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's complete. You sure you can't get it to five or four at least? Maybe, let's see. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, I, I, think, I think this is okay. It's, it's the best I can do. I told you, I'm not a poet. You're a great poet. Thank you so much, Professor. You're welcome. I hope your wife gets better. Of course. Uh, I'll let you know. Yeah. Naturally. <laughs> Maybe with, just without breaking into my house. Well, <laughs> yes, certainly. Thank you. And again, my apologies. And now i got to run to the hospital to read to her the new poem. Well, you don't want to read it here first? No, I want to read it with her. Oh, all right. Well, let me know. Of course. <laughs> uh, should I need more poems? I can count on you, right? <laughs> what do you want me to say? Okay? Okay. Hi. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, up next is my hero. Uh, Neo Héroe by Juliana Musso. My name is Mark Atkinson. I directed the piece. Um, the play is made up of three distinct monologues. The protagonists of the monologues are three mothers of many Italian soldiers who took part in the International Security Assistance Force mission in Afghanistan during the years 2008 to 2010. Two of the mothers in the play uh, lost their son in battle. The three women are from very different uh, backgrounds, uh, social extraction, geographic origin, personality, but they share the experience of having a soldier's son. M the mother's talk is interlaced with memories of childhood, stories of tragic events, considerations of their children's choices. The characters are inspired by existing people and real life events. Tonight, you're gonna hear a section of Giordana's story, read by Eliza Greensmith. These flowers are so pretty. They're really pretty. I hate them. <laughs> it's my head. It's not, it's not working like it used to. Snow, for example. Snow is so beautiful. It's so soft. It's so white. I hate it. <laughs> If it snows, I won't go outside. It's my head. It's not working like it used to. I will die completely crazy. Maybe it's best. For me, he's not dead. He's somewhere doing something important. I have my reasons for saying this. First of all, when I received the news, I was having breakfast. I had turned the TV on. And I saw written, Afghanistan, Italian soldier found dead. Ah, great news. Great news to start off the day. Now, I had a piece of croissant in my mouth. It became like stone. I couldn't swallow it. I had to spit it in the sink. My husband came into the room and asked, did you call Stefano? And I said, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't want to bother him at the moment. I don't feel like it. And then the doorbell rang. For starts, he had always told us, if you see two soldiers at the door, it's all right. It means I'm just injured. If you see three soldiers, be strong, I'm dead. I saw two soldiers. Yes, just two soldiers. The third came later. Why did he come later? He fell out of his tank. He fell on the snow. I hate snow. I know it's my head, it's not working like it used to. I will die completely crazy. Probably it's for the best. I'm all right physically. I smoke cigarettes and I drink coffee like a Turk. For me, it's doing what I used to do with him. He came home almost every week. 
First thing, he'd go and he'd say hi to the dog. He would say to him, hey Stinky, you stink more and more each day, because we had a very stinky dog. <laughs> then he'd come in and he'd put his stuff down and he would wash his hands. And then he'd come into the kitchen and he would say, so where's the coffee? Ah. So we'd prepare some coffee and then we would go out onto the balcony and we would smoke a cigarette and we would talk. We would talk about everything. We'd, we'd call each other every day to talk for a bit. If we couldn't talk, he would give me a ring just to tell me that he was okay. I'm not mad at the country or at the Taliban. I'm mad at Jesus Christ. And when I go up there, and I'm not, I'm not gonna take my own life. I'm not stupid, but I will go up there sooner or later, right? I mean, we all do. So hear me out. When I go up there, someone will come down. You'll think it's a meteorite passing through, but instead it's Jesus Christ himself who will come down. And let him, let him go and see for himself what's up down here in Afghanistan or in Iraq. Let him go see where and why our sons died. And if Jesus asks me what my son was doing in Afghanistan, I will answer him. Because my son didn't go to Afghanistan to kill people, no. He went to help them, organizing aid for a local population. He'd go talk to Afghans without a helmet or a safety jacket so that he wouldn't scare them. When the region was flooded, he came out every day to help people. He would call me and he would tell me that he was working in the office. And then he'd make these paper noises so that I would believe him. Instead, he was out there in all kinds of danger. Jesus Christ will come down like a meteorite. And when he comes down, he'll pass another one coming down like a rocket, Mohammed, with his big beard. Because I bet that there is some mother and father somewhere in Afghanistan who is as furious as I am for sure, who will send him down as well. Because all those soldiers dying around the world, they're not born out of rocks, are they? Are they born out of rocks? I don't think anyone is born out of rocks. Somebody cleaned their nose, their teeth, their butts, their hair. They spoon fed them. They healed their cough, their fever. They told them a bedtime story. They sang them a lullaby. They gave them a dog, a bike, a birthday cake. They were not born out of rocks. So, why should I be angry at the country? Who's the country? We are the country. I am the country too. And I don't think anybody here wants to go to war. I don't think that we want to send our sons to die. Am I wrong? Am I not thinking right? No, no, no. Because if I'm wrong, tell me. If we are not the country, what are we? Are we imbeciles? Are we slaves? What, what are we? No, we are the country. Everyone does his own share. And Stefano did his, and we are proud of him. But not for the medals that he earned, but for the person who he was. I, I only put medals on him the day that I went to pick him up because I know how he really disliked these sorts of things. He didn't care for them at all. He didn't care for rank, he couldn't have cared less. He used to say to his, sol his soldiers, here on the military base, one has to respect the uniform. But outside, everyone's equal, everybody. He respected people, and that's why he was respected so well. He was special. They had already given Stefano a medal anyway, two months before. He would have picked it up himself with his own two legs if he had come back. He had already made it through so many terrorist attacks. And he'd always come out okay, him and his soldiers. He was good. He was good at his job. He had never stopped studying. 
He knew several languages. He knew chemistry, engineering, law. We didn't even know how many diplomas he had or special assignments that he had been given or licenses. We only found out, la found out later with a stack of paper this tall. He'd never talk to us about work, never. He'd see what needed to be done and he would do it without much talk. One day I had to corner him to make him answer me when we were on the balcony. And I asked him, Stefano, Stefano, answer me. Why do you have to go back to Afghanistan? What is the use? You have money, you have rank. And he said to me, Mom, these people need help, that's all. And that's what, that was it, that was what it was. Now, few words he said so as not to get confused. And he was right, because words now disgust me. If words were meatballs, I wouldn't feed them even to my dog because he wouldn't have them anyway, because they wasted so many words when they sent our soldiers to Afghanistan. First, capture bin Laden. Second, stop international terrorism. Third, stop opium traffic. Fourth, bring democracy. Fifth, free women from the use of burqas. So, bin Laden was captured after 10 years, and we don't know if it was really him, because they threw him into the sea before they could even show us. And of all the rest of the points, they didn't even get to one, not even close. The country is a mess. Attacks and bombs are everywhere. Hunger, unemployment, corruption. What democracy? What? The drug traffic has doubled. Women still wear those damn burqas. And terrorism. Yeah, yeah, that was fixed, right? Of course. My husband tells me to wake up. What do I expect? They couldn't say that they wanted vengeance for the Twin Towers. I could be completely crazy, but I did figure out a thing or two. So, in New York, those bastards, those terrorists, killed 3,000 citizens, 3,000. Afghanistan, 3,500 soldiers from America and other countries died. Do I need to say that again? 3,500. Vengeance? What are you talking about? Words. <laughs> Poisonous meatballs. What kind of vengeance is that? It's like if I wanted vengeance on a son for a son who was killed, so I send the other son to die. What are you talking about? Even if it was vengeance, can you explain to me what has Afghanistan have to do with anything? What? The bastards, the terrorists, who crashed against the World Trade Center were from Saudi Arabia. They were not from Afghanistan. From Saudi Arabia, like bin Laden. And Saudi Arabia has a regime too, with money, though an American ally. So, I'm not getting it. So everyone here in Italy voted to go to Afghanistan except for four losers, some communists, I'm not sure. And to those four losers, I won't say anything. And to everyone else, the same people who now want to come and give me my son medals, I want to ask you one thing, just one simple question. What did Stefano die for? Nobody take offense at the question. You'd be asking yourself this too if you had a child who was six feet under, who died in an explosion or was shot in Afghanistan, maybe an only child who was smart, good, like mine was. A tribute of blood. Italy pays with a tribute of blood. What do they think when they say these words? Because I think of Stefano still, every day. And I think of other soldiers too. The sons of other parents. I took a picture of all 53 of them together in one big frame and I put it on my wall because up in heaven, I imagine all of them hanging out there together, keeping each other company, smoking cigarettes, drinking a beer. That's why I'm still alive. Because I don't think they want me up there. Not yet. They'll be up there saying, I hope no one's mother comes up here to break our balls because we're fine just amongst us. And they're right.
from The Great Walk by Fabrizio Sinisi. Uh, in this <coughs> excerpt, it's from the play about the president of the International Monetary Fund, Frederick Jean-Paul. He is arrested and kept in an anonymous New York police station. He's accused of sexual violence inflicted on a waitress. His two bizarre jailers, Donald and Frank, have been ordered to guard the prisoner until the following morning when he will be brought to a safer location. However, things don't go as planned. Jean-Paul shows signs of an inexplicable anxiety. Barbara, Jean-Paul's wife, and Marcel Labiche, his lawyer and secretary of the French Socialist Party, soon break into the police station. And uh, welcome, please, Star Kirkland and Michael John Rosa. Time, not haste, is a poor advisor. Time flattens most squirrels. Time lengthens distances. Minutes pass here, rage evaporates, and a new wisdom grows. A new wisdom, a weak and fearful awareness of what happened. Which is terrible. Yes, and in my mind, it's still terrible. However, an idea creeps along here that says, this too is man. And I feel like if another minute passes, perhaps I will not even be able to hate him like I'd like. That Frederic whom I love arises again, and instead of being in conflict with this Frederic who has raped, completes his own image, making it even more alive to me. Yes, this too is a man. And yet, I wonder how one can love this debased beast. Love him notwithstanding feeling so much pain, and no matter how intolerable this capacity is to continue to love, always, still, yet with more strength as this need grows, the danger of not being what one needs to become, one needs to be becomes imminent. Yes, this too is a man. One must have pity on man, but not only on him, on me, on us, on everyone. I know I'm afraid of entering that room. More than anything, I fear the unexpected. For years, I've done everything to protect myself, and now his attack is intolerable to me. I don't know what to ask him. I've prepared anything, and now I'm terrified of having to listen to him for too long. Finally, you're here. Oh, I couldn't stand the idea of you outside in that horrible way. We have very little time. Tell me what happened. Oh, um, they, they came to get me, and they took me where I didn't want to go. They'll kill me. And they kept me here like a beast inside this slaughterhouse. They want to slaughter me. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't want them to, I don't want them to slaughter me. I'm afraid. Uh, what are you saying? Are you crazy? I'm not crazy, Barbara. Everything is set here. Everything is already in place. The hotel, the, the, the girl, this place. Oh, you've lost your mind. Oh, my head is hurting. Wait, no. You know you have to give me an answer. That girl, did you rape her? I've raped her, yes. But th 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 those hands were mine. The sex, the rage, and that surge, the anxiety, and the sweat. Even if all those things were mine. Deep down, it, it's all of very little importance to me. Of everything I've done, the only thing I really feel like is mine is a strange nostalgia to go back to that innocence. That innocence that I don't remember and that was given to me. Not to my time, but, but to my skin. Innocence and guilt, they are words that touch someone that I'm looking for too. Someone that can say I and I can relate to like the, the something missing from my own gestures. I bless the darkness of this violence of mine. Barbara, do you understand me? Whose fault is it then? Oh, you're more cruel than my jailers. No, you don't want a man. No, you want a culprit at any cost. I don't know how to answer you. Who knows? The guilt the, the, might be of that girl herself. The girl? Of her sadness. She seemed so... Uh, an outflowing stream of sadness, of that divine sadness, unbearable. The sadness of those souls they call saints, or someone that doesn't belong to this world. Maybe they paid her to seduce me. Maybe they paid her to talk. It isn't important. That was her, and that's enough. She and that sadness of hers. But people like Marcel, or even you, Barbara, can't understand these things. But a naked person is a shock to you. 
I didn't oppose any resistance. I was taken by that sadness, like, like desire. It was profoundly mine. More than, more than ever, it was truly mine. Mine forever and ever in that single moment. Tell me what happened in that hotel room. I was trying to touch something. Meat, fire, rock, life. You can do that so rarely. You can't live without trying, though. Everything started way before the trap, before that girl, at the airport, maybe. On the ladder, like a, like a vertigo, the smell of the asphalt that, that fried in the heat, and the foreheads of the men, those foreheads marked by time, like gazes like little statuettes under the sun planted in someone's garden. And that lethal tiredness, that burning, obtuse desperation that I saw in every man's gaze, and that fiery light, otherworldly. Who knows if I have ever been happy? That was what I asked myself in that moment. Has this life of mine ever been happy? Fiercely meaningful, full to the point of overflowing? Have I ever been happy? And as I was waiting, I wonder if you, Barbara, have ever been? Well, tell me, have you? Yes. Hmm? Maybe. Sometimes. When? When we got married? When Camilla was That's born? That's not true! I remember when Camilla was born. I remember our wedding. I was not, not happy. I was a rock. I felt empty, suffocating. And, and, and beyond all that sense of duty, the effort to confine myself to that joy, a joy that went to the wrong direction that day, that joy didn't come to the appointment that was scheduled a long time ago, where I was to be seen as the guest of honor, as the man that sits at the head of the table, well, it was a party anyway. I should have stopped it. Send everyone home, fire the musicians, the catering service, the waiters, because joy didn't come to the altar. The party is over, and everything should have ended there. Without resentment, since it was nobody's fault, or if it was somebody's fault, joy was the guilty one. She was the one that was to be celebrated and, and invited to the center of the altar, the center of the scene, and she didn't come. She avoided us without giving any notice or nor excuse. Joy is the one that needs to ask forgiveness. I don't understand how all of this is coming back at this time. Why did this click exactly now? I found this out only yesterday. A new knowledge that takes over me. I can't do without. And as I was coming down that ladder and running in the streets to find a taxi and in this insignificant time between things, a guy from Slovenia came and ran me over. Well, I had ruined the Slovenian banks. I thought that happiness was not possible. Not in this world, and not with me. With this anxiety of mine. I felt my whole body like a naked nerve. A burnt bone exposed to the wind. I have never felt so much pain in my life. from her father 
that the edge of black holes is the event horizon because it moves away as we get closer, which is how future works too. So she runs away in order to learn how to get back. Reading Francesco Andolfi, Adriana Rossetto, John Carlin, Marian Godel, and Alice Parente. Orizzonte degli eventi, Event Horizon, by Elisa Cassari. Characters, Olga, Marco, her boyfriend, Franco, her father, Giulia, her mother. <laughs> An empty room, a studio, no windows. On the left wall, there's a small sink and a kitchenette. On the right wall, the entrance door, no door knob. On the front wall, there are many doors in all shapes and colors. They hang crooked or straight in a confusing display of exits. Only one door is properly functional, and that's the bathroom door. There is no furniture, none. The room will be furnished and modified throughout the play. A girl nervously walks around the room. She scratches her eyes, weeps. She's very nervous. She tries to open the entry door, but no success. She goes into the bathroom, comes out, goes in, comes out. <laughs> she keeps walking. Where? I would like to know where and how. How does this work? It's not really possible. It's incomprehensible. How did I get stuck in here? And why is this room so empty? It wasn't empty. I know, I know. <clears throat> Marco, where are you? Are you hiding? Are you pulling my leg? Marco, it's not funny. <sighs> Doesn't happen. These sort of things don't happen. It, it can be true. Olga sits facing the wall of doors. I read it once, how one can understand if he's dreaming. I, I, I think you have to, to look at a watch twice in a row or, or, or read a sign twice in a row. And, and if the letters would be different or, or the hands of the clock would move because there's, there's no time and space continuum in the world of dreams. But here I have no clock and not even a word to read. Maybe, maybe I can try flying or levitating, and if I succeed, it, it would mean that I'm in a dream. Oh, what the hell am I doing? Of course I'm not dreaming. She pinches herself. Ow! <laughs> okay, Olga, relax. You came in from there, and from there, you'll go out. Olga tries to open one of the doors, the biggest one. It opens. She goes in. She comes out of the bathroom door. How does this work? I even have to go which I even have to guess which one is the right door. Marco, help me please. She walks around the room again and then she starts counting the doors. I I need a counting rhyme. That's that's what I need. One, two, three, four, five. Once I caught a fish alive. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then I let him go again. Why did I let him go? Because he bit my finger. So, which finger did he bite? This little finger on my right. Her finger stops on one of the doors, and she goes in. Marco comes out of the bathroom, bringing a chair. I changed the light bulb. <laughs> Olga. <laughs> Where the hell did she go? Olga re-enters. My god! Marco! There you are, finally! Slap! Shit! Mm -hmm. I let it shot. Marco, we're stuck. <laughs> we're stuck in this place, and I'm doomed to go around in circles in rooms that are all the same as this hey, one. Hey, 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 what's the matter? Uh, why, what are you saying? Why are you coming up with all these crazy stories? I just changed the light bulb in the bathroom. Aren't you happy? <laughs> I don't know how to tell you what I'm about to tell you. You're breaking up with me? Again? <laughs> I, I, I know you're going through a rough time, Olga, but 
This is not the way. Uh, trust me, you'll feel better. Just... <laughs> Listen to me, Marco. I'm stuck in this room. Actually, now we're stuck in here. There's no way out. The entry door isn't working. It doesn't open. Of course it doesn't open! <laughs> I... The door not fell off, but I promise I'll fix it. But, as you know, the doorknob is in the sink. <laughs> you can put it back on the door and it will open. I know this house is gross. There is no need for you to remind me. But I think it's a miracle my grandmother left it to me. <laughs> it's my home. Do you understand? It's my home A and yours. <coughs> it's our home. What's the matter? You want to leave? You don't understand, and that's fair because what's happening to me is absurd. I can't understand it myself. Those doors on the wall are some sort of passage. Any door I open brings me right back in here to this same room. Sit. No. Please sit down on the only chair we have. I know, you hate the situation, but things will work out. I promise you, we'll fix everything. Marco, listen to Happy me. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. From one of the doors, Happy Julia and Franco, Olga's parents, enter with a cake, topped with a birthday candle in the shape of the number 10. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Olga is distraught. She blows out her candle. You're in double digits now, sweetie. <laughs> You're a big girl. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Marco, this is my mother. You understand it's not possible, right? I want it to be possible too, but it's not. Look, look how young my parents are. What's not possible? Today is my birthday, and clearly I'm not ten. The parents start bickering. Yes, you are. And I want to eat that cake. Is it chocolate cake? I hope they didn't put fruit in it. Can't you see we're grown ups? We're thirty years old, and that's my mother. I have pressed. Your armpits are hairy. Check them out. Come on. You know, Olga. I don't know if I want to be your boyfriend anymore. <laughs> You're so weird. Why do you say these things? And then, you don't even have titties. Look. Olga touches her breasts. Marco laughs, pushes her, and she falls. But don't hurt yourself, Olga. We didn't know each other as kids. Understand? What's happening? What the hell is going on? The other kids are playing dodgeball. Come on, come on, let's hurry, let's hurry, let's go. Marco goes out. Olga turns to look at her parents. Don't freak out. You're 30 years old. Your mother went away when you were a little girl. Your dad is older than this. This is a dream, a nightmare, or, or something. You have to focus and figure out how you ended up here. What was I doing? Where, where was I? What happened to this room? Twisted it into itself. What are these doors? Olga's mother slaps her father, places the cake on the chair, and goes into the bathroom. Daddy? Olga, go play with the other kids. Julia, we can't go on like this, pretending like it's nothing. It's not good for Olga. It's not good for anybody. You need to ask yourself what it is you want from your life. I know very well what it is I want from mine. No answer. Olga goes to the kitchen sink, sees the doorknob, and picks it up. Sees the door, but the doorknob that Marco had fixed before is still there. Franco stops knocking, goes to the cake, removes the birthday candle, and puts it in his pocket. He picks up the cake from the chair and puts it on the floor. He starts talking to himself. So this is how you leave. The moment has come for us to part ways. I'm sure. Dad, that... are you okay? Olga, you're here. Yes, I'm. You have to help me. 
I have a huge problem. I have to understand this thing, and maybe you're the only one that knows. It's not as bad as you think. You move to another city. You meet new people. You go to college. As I remember it, you're about to have one of the happiest times of your life. And, and not to say that the years with you weren't amazing, but you know, your, your mother, things didn't work out well. Well, don't be scared. Be excited. You see these doors? I can't understand how, doors, but- Doors, sweetie. Don't be scared of anything. Don't throw yourself towards solutions. Don't save time. Let me give you some advice. Lose time. Lose as much of it as you can. Don't try to find the shortest way towards what you think is right. Don't try to find linear solutions. Explore. Go off the beaten path. Ask yourself if there's something else you want. I, I'm not saying to put yourself in danger. But don't play it safe all the time. But don't play it safe, either. I remember this conversation very well. Behave. And you don't always have to be first. I did nothing but be first my whole life. Look where I am now. I graduated first. I was the first to get married, first to have a child. The first one who ended up alone. Just a couple of days ago, I was thinking that the shortest amount of measurement of time is the second. Do you understand? The second, not the first. So, Olga, try to be sick. <laughs> now you have to go. Wait, Dad. I need to ask you something. Maybe, maybe if I say it in a crazier way, you will answer. Where does time flow? In, in the water pipes, in the wiring, in the space between the hardwood floor? Is there a chance to catch it and stop it? Like being stuck in a hallway where your whole life is at your fingertips, but you can't do anything about it, and you don't know why. Olga, you have to go. If it's me who has to go, why is it you who's going? Stop! Dad! Try to help me. Just give me a hand, please. What's happening to me? Olga eats some cake and spits it out. <laughs> it was a nine-year-old cake after all. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, we we have to have some drinks for you all again. Thank you you for staying, and um, we will have like 10, um, 10 15 minutes uh, uh, that deal between us, and then we're going to open up um, to questions. First of all, um, I think this was a strong begin in reading, and uh, I think uh, we hearing uh, voices. Uh, doors and that open and closes both from the past or from the present. So I think that especially the last piece was was uh, um, was an, it, 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 something that could be a theme for what we have and we also have you with us here. But since it's two o'clock in Italy and uh, <laughs> and uh, Giuliana, can you hear us? Thank you. Can you say something? You see we hear yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, um, uh, uh, were you able to see the live stream of the readings? It's hard to. Uh, what you see? Um, did did you could you see live stream your reading? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, it's been very touching for me. Really, I the actress, the actress that. My, my, I would like to hear. Yeah, I think it's hard to hear. Um, what? What's your name? Eliza. Um, it, it's Eliza Greensmith. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure. Really, thank you. And uh, could, could you detect uh, a, different, uh, a different tone to it, a different uh, uh, um, Vibration that from the plane Italy, does it feel different to hear it in America and English in New York? Well, I, first of all, I'm a man. So I do the piece you heard. I do the So we, I think uh, we, we, it's really hard to hear. Maybe uh, Brad uh, and uh, Michael try to uh, close it and call again, and maybe we, we go on here with the. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, let's try again normally. It, 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 um, it does work. So maybe we go um, to Lisa, who is uh, here with us. So thank you again for making the long journey. You arrived last night. So you are, oh, it's also 2 o'clock for you. Yes. <laughs> so uh, what is your reaction of hearing uh, um, the, the play, or the extra? So, testing? OK. Uh, so Elisa Cassidy will be speaking in Italian, and I'll be translating for her. So. They are with us. Preferisco parlare in italiano perché altrimenti risolvi. She prefers talking in Italian. In realtà, il testo in italiano non è mai andato in scena. The play in Italian has never been produced. Non ancora. Not yet. E, e quindi in realtà per me questa è la prima volta che lo vedo, lo vedo recitato da qualcuno. So this is the first time that she sees her play alive, um, acted by actors. Yeah. Ed è stato molto, molto bello e molto interessante, soprattutto perché eh, ci sono alcune intenzioni che sono diverse, che io ho dato e che invece sono state... It was very beautiful and, and interesting, uh, especially because there are uh, certain intentions that were different that she has given and that... E, e questa è la, credo sia la, la, la cosa la che più... Io sono una scrittrice, quindi di base... Eh, tutto quello che scrivo in realtà eh, resta sulla carta, non viene mai, non diventa mai carne. Uh, she's a writer, uh, she writes novels, and everything that she writes remains on paper, and it doesn't come alive in the theater. E, e quindi non, cioè, è, è pazzesco, è pazzesco che questa storia qui, che è venuta a me in questa maniera, cioè eh, è stata la, la storia che ha cercato la sua forma, e non io che ho cercato questa forma, perché è stato il mio terzo approccio al teatro e è it was crazy it was a very good experience and uh, to be honest it was the uh, text the narration that found its own media uh, this is just my third time approaching theater e quindi niente sono molto sono molto felice di di tutto ringrazio gli attori che sono stati bravissimi il regista e uh, she she's very happy and she is very thankful and she's uh, thankful to the directors and the actors. Well, well, thank you again. And the Italian Advisory Board, just to give you an idea how this worked, we had an American Advisory Board of five, six uh, people who suggested place from America, from the US, they thought might be working in Italy, send it over, and uh, the Italian choose, chose a couple of plays that will be done in Rome on the 15th of December. 
And the Italian play, also the ones we have here, were suggested by uh, a prestigious advisory board from Italy. They are directors and dramaturgs and writers and journalists. And then the American advisory board thought, this look sounds interesting. So it really is done uh, by, uh, by, by a group of curators to put it together. And it's interesting and surprising to have uh, your play that won a prize, but still to be the first uh, reading here in Italy, uh, here in, uh, in New York and in Italy. So thank you again. So we, let's try um, again, um, the Juliana, can you hear us? It's very hard to understand what you say. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, but it sounds a bit better. So tell us a little bit the impression of uh, uh, hearing your monologue, which of course is also so very well, so much connected to the US or New York. It comes even up. How, how does it, uh, how did it feel for you to hear it? It was a surprise uh, that if you choose to perform, to play this uh, piece of it, because I thought it could it be too much to do it in New York. I was um, afraid of it. T uh, tell but us. I, I believe it's your, it's your people uh, that I'm talking about. But I, I know that this uh, play, my hero, I honestly uh, wrote it because I believe that we all have to cry a little bit together for we the people, the people, everybody, you understand what I mean? So um, what I, I learned from the mothers of these soldiers is that crying is a good thing to understand what happens. So you interview. When I saw the actress crying a little bit, and I see her now with a baby, <laughs> uh, I'm happy for those tears. So thank you very much. Thank you. And so you, you. so you interviewed mothers of uh, Italian soldiers that went to Afghanistan. Yes. Yes. All the guys that talk about in the play. Uh, real existence. I mean, real people. Yeah. So here we see that uh, you know what the vibrations is of uh, are for politics of uh, American politics, but also then into global politics. Uh, Valeria, um, tell us a little bit of humanism and why did you decide to do this project of exchange? Oh. First of all, I decided because you get me to, to, do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to invite me to do that. No, and, uh, and then of course I, uh, I work in theater for a long time, so I, I love my job. And uh, when you ask me why don't we do something uh, to promote Italian contemporary playwrights, I say, sure, sure, I will, I mean, okay. Uh, and also because I am a little crazy. So uh, maybe I, I did uh, this project because of it. Maybe. And maybe both. A lot of things. But I, I think I have a mission. Everybody have a mission. But I, I think I have this mission to, uh, as you told this uh, morning, to demonstrate uh, with my experience that, that we can do something to change. And I, d I don't love to complain. And I love to act. Not in a, not on the stage. <laughs> 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 so uh, this is why I did, but also because my company co is called uh, Humanism without the H, because uh, is the crisis between uh, Humanesimo. It is a beautiful word. It is a beautiful period uh, of our culture, and uh, humans. There is a in international word that means uh, something that born from uh, the human being. So I think we need uh, to start from the human being and to approach a new humanism, humanis, humanesimo, to start a new renaissance, for sure. For everybody, for the mothers, uh, for uh, the theater, for the daily life, uh, and so on. So it is why I did uh, this uh, project. 
Yeah, and I, I think these are uh, uh, stories of our Italian um, players we can relate to. They are, of course, Italian in a way, but they also they are universal. Maybe our question to um, the directors, or maybe we start with you, Ari, and then go down here. So, um, your impressions about those plays? Do they work? Do they not work? Are they <coughs> Italian? Are they European? Or, uh, how how did it feel to work with them? This, I, to be honest, they only got excerpts. They didn't have the full play. They couldn't look at the full play in Italian, but it, they have not been yet fully translated. Um, so, give us a bit um, your um, impression. Yeah, I've been so lucky because uh, uh, I could read the whole play actually <laughs> to prepare, and that was like uh, very useful in a rehearsal uh, to have a, a conversation with uh, John Goldsmith. Uh, sorry, John Gold Rubin. <laughs> sorry. Um, who, who actually was the director of the reading. But we both had so much fun. And r r watching the other uh, three pieces, I kept forgetting that they were by, uh, written by Italian writers. I kind of like had to like remind myself that these were Italian playwrights because they were so universal. And... Um, so that's what we perceived too as we were working on it. We were trying to look at other references to make up these characters and have a clear understanding of the, uh, of the situation where Olga is in. And, uh, and we would throw in any kind of reference uh, from movies uh, to books that were not necessarily Italian. And... Uh, um, I think that it, it was so beautiful to listen to these stories and uh, to uh, listen um, these writers talking about these very strong women. <laughs> if I can add that, like we saw a mother and we saw a wife and a daughter struggling and uh, a man so in love with his wife that he is ready to do anything for it. Um, so it was really an honor to like work on this piece. And thank you so much, Adriana, to involve me. <laughs> and it was so great to work with John. He was so um, like just open to any ideas from me, the other actors, and like open to to just explore more and more, even if it was just just a reading. Yeah, and so beautifully acted, like the others, little Olga and Vandalin. Sorry, but some said it made me think of my family and my parents and and of all of it, I really would like to see the whole play as everybody I hope will s <laughs> see soon. So again, thank you for coming. I'm Sarah. Oh, yes. <laughs> I turned it off. I'm sorry. Um, uh, it was such a privilege to get to work on this little excerpt and it just mel made me want more. And I'm a little bit jealous that um, the, the other playwrights are in the room because I think all, all I want to do is just talk more to them. And I mean, it's like every play that we work on, um, I'm just <laughs> I'm looking at the text and trying to find my way through it. And so whether it's written in English originally or in Italian originally, I'm looking for what does the playwright what is, it, what is he trying to say? What is she trying to say? And, and what are we going, uh, how are we going to work our way through this? And I think um, the, the first one, um, A Notebook for Winter, is it just, it, it's reaching for this connection between two people. And it's just very simple. That's the little chestnut in there. And so that was easy for us to kind of determine and then uh, look to try and find it. And the second one, it was about what is the tone of this piece? It's so poetic, and uh, and and the how are we finding the humanity through that style, and and what does that mean? What is the player? I, I can't wait to. I hope I get to talk to these playwrights um, to try and feel out more what what what's in the rest of the play, and and what else uh, what else are we looking for through this style? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I hope we will have full translations maybe also again, also in, uh, in a book form, uh, like we did with the other play. So, um, Mark, tell us a bit uh, about your journey. Sure. Yeah, um, well, thank you, Juliana, for letting us work on it. Um, uh, so, I mean, I suppose there's two things to talk about. I mean, firstly, uh, I think that um, it's an apt time to be telling a story about women mothers uh, interrupting a cycle of violence or trying to figure out how to uh, disturb cycles of violence that have occurred throughout um, 
our history. So I think we had a lot of conversations about, uh, about what it means to tell that story now. And then separately, I think when you're working on documentary pieces where uh, the, the text is coming from interviews with real people who've been in these situations, obviously you have a very specific responsibility to try and articulate those stories uh, in a respectful, in a sensible, in an accurate way. Um, so a lot of our conversations became about what does it mean to do that in translation when, yes, this is the real text, but it's been translated, and so it's at a remove, it's at a distance. So we had conversations about how to make certain phrases relatable to an American audience or not, and if you change that, is that uh, changing the original intention? And you know, so a lot of a lot of our conversations centered around that. And um, uh, yeah, I think that's a particularly interesting challenge about uh, working on documentary theater through another language. In a way, it's. Uh um, as you say, you know, we had to translate it or into another place, but in a way it also came home. So it was, um, you know, the journey also so beautifully acted. Maybe we open up um, right away to, uh, to uh, questions here, Mark, uh, 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 Bright and Michael, if you could put a little bit of light up uh, um, to the audience. We also have an audience microphone to go around. Can, can I just yeah. add, uh, I, I want to just uh, um, give you a little portrait about uh, the authors, uh, because uh, this uh, edition, uh, have uh, very different authors, uh, uh, one to the other. So Elisa presents herself and also Juliana, but I, I, I want to add that Juliana is a very famous actress in Italy. So she works a lot, uh, and, it, and this is why you are here in a video and not here in person. And, uh, and then uh, we have, uh, so, uh, and also very well recognized uh, from everybody of us. Uh, and then uh, we have, uh, Fabrizio Sinisi is, is uh, another writer and director, but not actor. And then uh, and, uh, he works a lot with uh, Massini, for example, for, with Piccolo di Milano. Uh, he's uh, very well recognized too, as author. And then we have uh, Armando Pirozzi, that is uh, an outsider, completely outsider, because he is uh, 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 an author for theater, he's a playwright. Very, very good playwright for uh, because everybody knows as a good playwright. He is a is a, a notebook for the winter. He is uh, um, on the on the list of the Hugo prizes now in many uh, in many parts. Also best actor, uh, best play uh, for sure. And uh, and he is uh, like. Uh, he don't use internet, he don't use a telephone, he's, a, he's a, like an old style uh, person. So just to have a, a portrait of uh, these kind of differences uh, between the, this edition, the other edition, where we met uh, others that were also actors, uh, directors, and many times producers by themselves. So we are switching a little bit, and this is thanks uh, to our advisory board that decided to uh, to vote these uh, plays. Uh, so thank you very much. I, I, I thank you, Marvin, because uh, you are here. <laughs> thank you, uh, you and to the other two. Yeah, I think it's a little bit, we talked about this today, the Siegel Center style, instead of having one person who knows everything and who you have to please, be Valeria or me, whatever. No, we ask a group of people, we say, what do you think? And they talk to their friends. And then we come to a consensus, very different model, but I think with surprising choices. So we have uh, the first reading of an Italian play uh, uh, here in New York, where the advisory board said, this is a, one of our strongest writer or a play that might get the Ubu Prize. It's not even known, but it comes here uh, first. So I think uh, this just shows the strong uh, um, value such a, such a project has. No, um, I think let's go out um, to the audiences. And um, do we have a microphone, or should we take one? Yeah, and um, yeah, and uh, so we not only we record it, we need to hear it, but we also want to hear it better. So, um, are there some questions or remarks? Um, first one over there. Um, hi. Um, so I was wondering. This is a little bit of a follow-up question to what um, I, Irena was saying, because she said uh, she had to remind herself that. Uh, the plays were Italian. So I was wondering, this is a question for the non-Italian actors and directors. Uh, I was wondering if you felt that there was something distinctively Italian 
in the way the plays were written or the way characters talk or the tone or something else. And if I may, I have a second question. Um, uh, I was wondering how uh, much you guys are familiar with Italian contemporary theater and uh, if this experience sparked your interest in Italian contemporary theater. Thank you. Um, I'll take that. <laughs> It was, it, it actually, you know, partly because the writing uh, made the acting easy and it, it, I feel like it touched on so many universals. Like there were, there were little things that made it specifically Italian, but really overall it was kind of, you know, like any mother, you know, who had a son that goes away, except for most American moms wouldn't be like, yeah, you know, like we drank coffee and smoked cigarettes out on the balcony, they'd be like, <laughs> but you know aside from that like little cultural differences like that I'd say no um, embarrassingly not as familiar with contemporary Italian theater as I would like to be and yeah the, it did it did spark an interest so yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not Italian. Um, I, I'm definitely interested. I have very little knowledge of contemporary Italian theater. And, and uh, have you ever seen a play from Italy? So far? No, I have never seen a play. Or read one. I've never read an Italian contemporary, contemporary play. Um, but uh, uh, what what struck me was, I mean, I, wa I wasn't I wasn't at all. There there was nothing. That, that made me think, oh, this is so foreign, this is so different. It's just, it's just, it's words, it's, it's play, it, it's human. And even in the, the text that is written in a specific poetic style, it's something that just, I guess as a dramatist, I understand. Um, but I absolutely want to know these people and I want to get to know these characters, and I want to know, I want to know the minds that created these pieces as well. So, so now I have to go to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another uh, comment or question or remark um, from the audience? Yeah, Fabio? Um, I remember two years ago when we, we did the first um, edition of um, of this event of Italian Prayer Project, and there was uh, we, we were having a conversation like this with the, with the directors and the authors, and one of the author basically said to to the, the director that the reduction that he did was totally wrong. Mm -hmm. and it was uh, Taglierini with a, with, a, with yes. and it was interesting for me because yeah because with this project is actually in uh, long term, so we basically finish the publication of the whole translation right now, what we started. So it was really the beginning and talking about what is wrong and what is right in the reduction of a project that is still yet to go, to, to be done. It was very interesting, actually. So I wanted to ask uh, Elisa, Juliana, if, uh, if you found something wrong in the reduction of your, of your play, something that sounds, you know, like... No, 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 io per quanto mi riguarda ho sbagliato niente. <laughs> She's talking about me because I did the translation. <laughs> so you see the little biased. <laughs> no, però mi ha molto colpito l'intenzione di alcune, cioè l'interpretazione del regista di alcune delle scelte. Cioè, uh, so, I forgot that I'm... Um, <laughs> she, <laughs> she didn't think that there was anything wrong, but uh, she was surprised by some of the choices uh, of the director. Però questa, per quanto mi riguarda, è una cosa bella e sorprendente, non è una cosa che svaluta, anzi... This is something that surprised, and surprised me, and it was good, uh, and nothing that took away from the play. For you, um, uh, uh, mi parlo in italiano perché sono le due di notte. She's gonna speak in Italian because it's meraviglioso, meraviglioso sentire le parole di quel personaggio che io conosco nel corpo, 
nel sospiri, nei, nei sorrisi, nelle esitazioni, sentirlo in un altro corpo, in un'altra lingua, è il regalo più bello che io possa desiderare. È bellissimo. So she said that it's marvelous to hear those words, uh, those smiles, those movements in another body, uh, in another language, is the most beautiful gift that a playwright can receive. Grazie a te, Giuliana. Another question, remark, um, thought? Maybe to, uh, to the actors a question. How did it? Uh, how does it feel? Um, uh, often a European uh, 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 playwrights or actors say it looks a lot of it. What we see in America it looks like it could be on television or it's uh, writing for a for a TV. Does this feel? Do you feel something different, or could, or would you say this could have come from a downtown writer? Um, this is actually the second Italian play that I've worked on. Um, I was in a play over the summer with Alice Parente. Um, that was also obviously translated into English. And then la yesterday I had the privilege of going to see beautiful Italian short plays um, at Alienation by the, the Kairos International Theater. And I feel like I'm just being embraced by this incredible, Italian theater scene in New York that I didn't know anything about six months ago. And the plays are marvelous. And they're not, for the most part, my experience of the writing is that it's very contemporary and very modern and very different from anything we're doing here. Um, pushing the envelope, pushing the limits of narrative storytelling in, in an incredibly interesting way. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that the translation is doing justice because I've studied theater, um, European theater, translated, you know, the translation is so important, it's really an interpretation always. So to have the play, living, playwrights living here, you know, and able to say, yes, you know, this is still the, what I was trying to say is, is really a gift, very special. Uh, I think it's the, when the writing is uh, as good as it is, and uh, uh, theater, and it, it gets to the humanism, um, it doesn't matter what country it's from. Uh, it, it, there may have been particular Italian uh, uh, elements, but uh, it was, for me, it was a, it was a little weird that it, it resonated so personally. I was like, why did you choose me for this? This is really strange. Um, and, uh, and the only other uh, strange uh, thing that we assumed, we assumed that, uh, that the, the, their marital difficulties was because he cheated on her, of course. We found out that she cheated on him. But anyway. <laughs> so in America, the guy cheats, always. <laughs> At least that's what we hear about. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so maybe Mario, we can ask you, what are we listening to uh, uh, um, the excerpts here? Mario, as you know, is a very well known. Well, can, can you take the, mic, the microphone? Because oh, yes. we're recording. I'm always interested in listening to contemporary plays. I always discover that uh, the playwrights in Italy are very modern are very introspective and give us wonderful insights into our society. But do you see uh, lines, uh, you know, temporalities through, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, or do you think something happened in the Italian playwright mm -hmm. scene? I see uh, a difference now. There's a little uh, more alienation. But up to two years ago, there was a very realistic approach and a very optimistic approach about Italian playwright. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you so much. So maybe as a last question to Valeria, um, what's next for the, uh, for the uh, Italian playwrights project? And maybe tell a bit about what's happening in Rome, but in general, what are your ideas? What's your vision and what do you want to do in New York? So first of all, I'm very grateful to everything I heard because uh, 
it's not uh, easy to produce Italian theater. And we talk a lot with Laura that does uh, something uh, very connected with this. And uh, it's not easy because uh, I, want, I don't want to use the, the term uh, discrimination because it's not uh, polite, it's not uh, the real uh, uh, term. But uh, uh, everybody is uh, mostly connected with the, the his own roots. So, Oh, you do Italian theater, so for Italians. No, it's not for Italians, it's uh, for all the world, no? So this is the challenge we have, to, to talk about theater, put out Italian, uh, Arabic, uh, German. I, I, don't, I don't care about the, the, the adjective. I, I, I care about the subject, theater. So this is uh, why I am uh, trying uh, to, put a to, to build a bridge uh, between uh, Italy and the US. So uh, this uh, second edition, that is also the, 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 the final of uh, the first edition with the book uh, that uh, we have here, and that is uh, printed right now. So it is <laughs> just uh, the, 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 the day the first edition is finishing and the, the second edition is starting. We are going uh, also in Italy to, um, to uh, do the same, the twin project with American playwrights. And, uh, and this is uh, very exciting because uh, the, the differences between uh, this project and <coughs> twin project will, will be shown uh, by the experience, but uh, now uh, is uh, uh, we are uh, we are uh, departing from the same points. You know, uh, everybody needs uh, to spread uh, the word the, the, the word uh, they they wrote. So uh, my role as a manager is to help the spreading. I I don't enter in uh, the judgment <laughs> about uh, this is good, this is not good. Uh, this is my taste. Uh, it doesn't matter. But uh, I, I, I need uh, to put my uh, experience, uh, uh, my uh, profi professional experience, uh, to help uh, this happen, both sides. So this is, uh, this is uh, what is happening now. And uh, I hope uh, uh, this start uh, um, a chain, how do you call it? Chain reaction. <laughs> chain reaction. <laughs> no, no, a chain supply. A chance to fly. <laughs> I need uh, every time the uh, supply chain uh, to um, for authors uh, where they can find uh, translators, uh, publishers, and productions and actors and so on. Well, I think New York is very happy that you came here. You are a very established producer in Italy with very big productions, big theaters. Normally, when people come over here, they is try to do something um, here and start out new, but this, uh, we have high respect for your work. And we also know you grew up with Dario Fo and uh, Peggy Guggenheim in Venice, so you have some, uh, some connection. So uh, we hope to see a theater festival of those plays, one here, hopefully here, and uh, maybe over a month that four or five of those plays could play in repertory and some of the directors could work with it, and uh, there are many other ideas. So, but congratulations to you. Thank you to all the writers, uh, Juliana, for being, uh, for being up. Festival, we need yeah. the donations. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you want the festival, this, we need uh, the it's, uh, um, As they said about, if there's a uh, will and has a way, right? This is, was this talk about it. William Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway, his wife. So uh, I think if there's a will, maybe Valeria has a way, and, uh, and I hope it will be done. But again, thank you, uh, Juliana, for staying up so long, uh, for Elisa to uh, travel here just to be with us. And, uh, congratulations and thanks to the actors and thanks to uh, thanks really uh, to the actors who really brought that to life so uh, thank you all there will be a reception here maybe you're interested to buy the book it's only $15 instead of 30 and uh, uh, we're losing money by $50 uh, by the way but I uh, hope you will come here and there will be a little a little gathering at the archive bar around the corner afterwards I think it's in the program. Thank you for coming. Thank You're a great you. audience, and thank you for sharing. Thank you.